Asalaamu As Alaikum and welcome back. If you're new here, my name is Farhad Dameen and I'm the author of the popular book Smart Single Muslimer and on this channel I provide Islamic solutions to the challenges Muslim women face. How did you find out about the facts of life and reproduction? Was it through friends, TV, older siblings or did you attend relationship with sex education lessons at school? Perhaps it was from your parents. If it was from your mum or dad, does the recollection of that conversation elicit some uncomfortable memories or a stuttered and mortified parent desperately trying to explain the facts of life to you? Yes, the topic that I'm speaking about today is why Muslim parents in particular have to discuss sex education. As a parent, there are certain conversations that are a joy and we welcome them with open arms. On the other hand, there are topics that make us feel awkward. Perhaps we don't know how to broach the subject of where did I come from when our kid asks us that. It's an inevitable question, but will you embrace answering it or are you dreading the day that your little kid puts you on the spot? So, why Muslim parents avoid talking about sex, you know, of course, age appropriately. So, many Muslim parents, because their own parents struggle to talk to them, that's why we avoid the subject of reproduction with our children. You know, parents were thinking, how do I begin to talk about this with my child? That's a frequent response, along with, I don't feel comfortable answering that kind of question. Or, what if I can't answer their questions? These are all the read things that come up in our head. And they're completely understandable. And I think on top of that, there is, because we have a sense of modesty, a sense of shame, hair in Islam, it's, we're not open, we don't talk about these things publicly, which is a good thing. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't speak about our ch it privately with our children. That That's the difference. So... Okay, let's just take a look at sex education in school. Um, there's a fear that talking about relationships will encourage our children to experiment too early. That's, a, you know, something we, we worry about. No wonder so many parents put their heads in the sand and leave it to schools. As a teacher, I, and, a, and I was a parent governor at my children's school when they were juniors, we um it was interesting that we were involved in discussions about how are we going to talk about sex education in the school you know it was um the school actually did have quite good reasons that this school in particular this was in east london so you know there's a there's a problem parents because they don't know how to talk about it they then think we'll just let the school deal with it yeah so that's the idea of putting your head in head in the sand and and so that's one view that's taken, let the school deal with it. Or there's the view that they're taking away our children's innocence. And this isn't just a concern held by Muslim parents. You know, you've got Christian, Jewish, you know, people of many faiths also have these fears. And so, you know, parents do feel that the state is encroaching on their authority and the right to teach their spiritual and moral values regarding relationships. So, it's, so they're, they're the two pulls that are happening but let's be honest, schools can indoctrinate. That's what they do. I'm a teacher, you know, from the books that we, they choose to teach. So in English, for example, you know, they, the t books that are taught in school have an effect on the children. You know, in, in England, for example, the book, um, in the UK schools, they wanted to introduce more Dickens and more um, English literature in, by English authors, and they took out American authors. You know, so the history that is taught, it's, you know, so World War One, World War Two, according to Britain's version of that, you know, you don't get to hear the German side of it. So we know that they indoctrinate our kids that, with a particular view. So, but we then have to think as parents that we should be no, under no un illusion. We have chosen to raise our kids in a non-Muslim society and it's a society where the state believes it should teach our children progressive liberal values regarding sex and relationship. Okay, so that's that's the reality check. So 
however we're feeling, we should understand that we have put our children in the schools. You know, so so we have some responsibility here. We, you know, that that's we have to be aware of it. So liberal governments are trespassing on our area, or on an area that's a parent's reserve. They argue it's a child's human right to be exposed to different lifestyles. And as they grow, they will develop their own views. So that's the argument they give that children should hear and learn about all lifestyles and all types of sexual relationships and then they can choose yeah that that's 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 their thinking that's the liberal thinking um schools argue that relationship and sex education lessons are essential because parents are not discussing puberty grooming contraception harassment or child abuse with their kids And then school and wider society has to deal with the fallout that stems from these problems. Now, I'm just going to just ask yourself, have you spoken age appropriately to your child about puberty? You know, the dangers of grooming, contraception, sexual harassment, child abuse. I think the schools actually have a very valid point here. If we're not going to talk, if parents are not talking to their kids about these things, you know, teenage pregnancy, that that's a big problem. So just historically, the UK has had one of the highest teenage birth rates, abortion rates and sexually transmitted infections in Europe. And what the successive UK governments have pointed to is that by having sex education in school, that is a way of tackling this problem. Yeah, so that that is so according to them, this makes perfect sense. Now, campaigners for compulsory teaching of sexual orientation and gender identity say inclusive teaching is an affirmation that you exist and your identity is valid. It's about acceptance from both for people from all backgrounds be that race, gender, sexual orientation, faith, class or disability. This kind of teaching will help foster greater inclusion, acceptance and understanding in our classrooms, playgrounds and school corridors. All the links for this information is on my is on my website. So that's what so they're the strong you know, they are very strong arguments of so school saying kids do are not aware and are therefore in danger um so we we have to step in and teach them and then you know people who are advocating you know a very fluid and progressive view of sexual orientation they're saying that there are so there in society there are many different types of people and types of um sexual orientation so kids have to learn to live with those types of people and accept yeah Okay, so that's what you've got coming now. Now let's take into account that what sexual education is your child and from a young age receiving from popular culture? And they are. So when your child consumes Love Island, Hollywood movies, Bollywood, Pakistani dramas, Netflix, Disney Channel, their views about relationships are being influenced. They're being shaped and when you're thinking how are they consuming it well they're consuming it when when we're watching it yeah if we're if we're watching it they're watching it and if they've got a any kind of mobile device you bet they're watching it yes yeah? so again let's be really um clear and honest and frank about the, what our kids are watching what they're learning so they're learning it at school they're learning it on tv they're learning it on all their mobile devices and then they're also learning it from their friends. Okay, um, so on-screen sex education is booming in popular culture, subtly stepping in to teach our kids about love, you know, their version of love. As you know, liberal societies have monetized sex and capitalism has no popular problem sexualizing childhood. So that that's quite a big topic in itself, but you know, you know, from... Um, the type of clothing that is um, designed for young girls. That's what I mean by sexualizing childhood. Um, the the way the fact that young girls you get um, lip gloss 
for three-year-olds. You know, you know better than me or how what's happening. Now, Sue Palmer, in her insightful book, 21st Century Girls, highly recommend that, explains... In the absence of any mainstream disapproval, market forces have cheerfully exploited the selling power of sex. It's left to parents to police the global marketplace and protect their children. So the net result is that is if we can't prevent our children from finding out the facts and they will be, they will be curious. Yeah. Uh, but do you really? So this is a question. Do you really want neck Netflix's Big Mouth. I've never watched that. It's a cartoon series or the series Sex Education on Netflix. I have heard about that. Teaching your child about lifestyle choices. Yeah, that's they're, they're, these are the easily accessible sources that they have. OK, so how should Muslim parents view relationship and sex education? So I've explained I, I'm not um, I'm not the type of person and I don't to create fear and I don't believe we should focus on the negative fear but what I just painted was just this is what's going on yeah anyone who we need to not be under the illusion that our children are not going to find out about um, these things the question is how and when so do you want the first person to introduce the topic of relationships and sex to your child to be their school teacher yeah, that's something you need to ask yourself. Is it okay for your kids to think you are clueless about teenage relationships and puberty? Because that's what they'll think. If you never speak about this to them, that's what they're going to think. Who do you want your child to turn to for advice about the nature of family or the de- definition of love? Their teacher, that's option one. Immature friends, number two. Or popular culture, number three. They're, they're the choices we're giving our children if we don't talk to them. Okay, so you, this is the this is the important bit. You, parents, want to be the first one to teach them self-respect, how to have a healthy attitude about their body, and the Islamic view regarding love and marriage. I was just on um, a website, Muslim Matters, and it was, um, there's a really good, they've got quite a few good articles on um just love marriage and sex and um there was one about sexual addiction there was one about um basically in the muslim community and it wasn't it was quite concerning to read but let's let's so let's move on uh they need to know that their moral source i.e their parents you are savvy nothing is going to fool you and you know what's going on yeah so when they are taught sex education at school or see things on their devices, they are not shocked and not tempted. They have been warned and prepared. So th- let me just, I'm going to reiterate that bit again, that when you take control and you make time and effort to learn what Islam says about these things and think of a way that how am I going to talk to my child because it, your child is unique. How you choose to talk to your child and how much you introduce will be different to other parents. So you, it, only you and your husband, I'm, I'm assuming I'm talking to mum's here, um, you need to come to that. Uh, there is also the option that you could, maybe you have a, um, you know, like a, they have a, a young uncle or aunt that would be good to talk to them about it. Yeah, that that's another option. Um, but there has to be an Islamic option here. And so when you do that, you've, um, so you've warned them, yeah, you've prepared them. And also you have reduced the impact of teasing and harassment that girls in particular face from boys after sex education lessons. So if it's not possible to take your child, different countries have different rules now. So you'll, you'll know what the rules are for your kids if they go to school. That one of the things I was reading a book, it's um, a return to modesty by Wendy Shallot. And what was interesting was she spoke about how she, her parents took her out of sex education. She, this was in like 20 odd years ago. No more than that, actually 30 years ago. Um, and um, what she said was the girl, cause she didn't go to the classes boys couldn't like in the lesson 
in a mixed class, men, girls and boys are taught about the different reproductive changes and how a girl's body changes. And the thing is, for boys, it's not so obvious, is it? And it's different. And then she said the boys would tease the girls. So they tease the girls who were not developing. They'd say, oh, you're, you should be on this stage by now, Jane, you know. And and the ones who were developing, they would also tease them. But so it's like we have to give our sons and daughters um, preparation and kind of um, talk to them what were you going to say to anyone who tries to tease you or how are you going to react to that whereas when we don't talk to them we're just sending them in blind and then they have no idea what to do they either just they'll cry like a lot of the girls her, Wendy was saying that's they'd cry and they'd be teased and they stopped going to school or they think I'm going to be as vulgar and rude to kind of act like an armor to protect myself from these boys so I'm going to be really brash and say oh I don't care I can, I can I'll talk about these things in a really shameless way as well and that that's a fact that is exactly what happens I'm speaking to some like kind of 20 year olds about this and their experience in UK and they were saying the same thing there was a, that they had a lot of teasing by boys and being um grabbed and felt up and it was just it just sounded so gross I went to a all girls school but the, we didn't have sex education back then so um, Ella saved me from that but our, unfortunately times have changed as you know so um, that's you know that's one of the reasons why we need to now um, if you're thinking uh, that again the idea if I tell them they're going to want to experiment but you know there's certain things we teach them about for example stranger danger you know, difficult conversations, things that we don't like, playing with matches, smoking, alcohol, drugs, you know, we carefully expose our children to these uncomfortable topics because they need to know how to deal with them. And with these issues, using the framework of the Quran and Sunnah. So therefore, the same wisdom applies to our SC education. Yes, that's the way I think we need to look at it, that we do these things anyway. We just have to get over I think a lot of it is our own uncomfortableness with this topic and but also if we're thinking I don't know how to well then we have to find out how to we have to learn we have to make an effort yeah I I think um I think we we can do that inshallah okay so let's just um I'm just going to run through a few hadith to help you know motivate us so um the following hadith illustrates how we should view behaviour that contradicts Islam within wider society, which we cannot change, compared to what happens in our homes, which is under our control. Because this is um, this is the idea of enjoining the good in our homes. So, Abu Sayyid al-Qudri reported, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Whoever amongst you sees evil, let him change it with his hand. If he is unable to do so, then with his tongue. If he is unable to do so, then with his heart. And that is the weakest level of faith. And that's narrated in Muslim. Now, the lowest level of faith is to reject evil in one's heart, and it is an obligation at all times. As for changing evil with one's tongue or words and with one's hand, or by direct action, it is only an obligation for those who are able to carry out its duties according to proper methods, principles and objectives. Ibn Rajab commented on the many hadith of this nature writing, all of these uh, traditions indicate that it is an obligation to condemn evil by the measures of one's ability. Yeah, so your capability is important. As for the condemnation in the heart, it is always required. Whoever does not condemn evil in his heart, it is a sign that faith has vanished from his heart. As for condemnation of the tongue and hand, it is only obligatory within one's capacity. So the reason why I have mentioned this hadith here is that it is in our control and it's in our capacity and capability to enjoying the good in our homes so teaching our children the correct view of um, sex and relationships and marriage and love we can do that no one's stopping us from doing that telling them what's you know the idea of you know, marriage is with a husband and a wife yeah we can definitely say that to our kids 
and that's our morals that's our principles we and we have to teach that to them really clearly what we can't do is stop this control at the moment we have no control over society societies have become too liberal too progressive and when it comes to relationships anything goes we can't stop that and therefore even putting um i would say you know there's even getting angry and um, focusing on certain types of relationships and going on about them a lot is pointless yeah we have to make our children strong and confident and that takes us talking to them and then controlling what popular culture we're allowing into our homes and what we're normalizing yeah we can't on the one hand say that yeah marriage is the um, foundation of you know the family that you know relationships out of marriage are wrong but then we're watching it and letting enjoying it that that sends two uh, two different messages to our children so we don't need to focus on condemning and getting into trouble or you know putting our energy into the outside and ignoring our children that that's what i would say if we're ignoring our children who are responsibility that that is a problem um so Allah says in the Quran, O oh believers, save yourselves and your family from hellfire fire, whose fuel is men and stones. And, and I'm sure you're aware of that. Um, the meaning of save yourselves and your family from the fire means turn them away from it, prevent them from it. Sayyidina Ali, in his commentary of this verse, um, as well as Kathada and Mujahid state, save yourselves from the fire through your actions and save your family from the fire through giving them all correct advice and guidance and there are three meanings to the phrase and save your family from the fire through giving them all correct advice and guidance and they are number one to command them to obey Allah and to avoid disobeying him this is what Qadada said number two to teach them all the obligatory aspects of their religion as well as to train them with the correct manners and correct conduct in their lives this is what Ali said and number three to on the one hand teach them the khair the good and to ensure they are made to live with it and to clarify what is wrong and bad so as to ensure they avoid it okay so these are things that we can do yeah and we should also say say our children don't need to repeat what they're taught at, you know to their non-muslim friends or even in argue with their teachers again that won't change anyone's mind yeah you can only talk to pe- talk and express ideas in you know there's a time where um doing dawa if you will um is possible and you know that people are going to listen or they're willing but if saying things is just going to get them into trouble we don't need to say everything we believe that that's what i would say yeah don't create tension where you don't need to but um so that's one point now i'd just like to mention the another very really important reason why we have to speak about this topic is that we need to protect our children from abuse sexual abuse so um and that's to safeguard them so as you're well aware child abuse is really speak, spoken of in muslim households to the extent you would think it is a sin that doesn't take place in our families and communities whether abroad i in in muslim countries or in the west and again i would ask you have you spoken to your child about sexual abuse and touching and what is appropriate and what is inappropriate again that's a way of we need to protect our children and the fact that all of us will know of um, cases of sexual abuse in muslim families yeah so it does exist cases of people going to visit family back home and abuse happening and there may be you know children won't tell you now but i've heard people then remember it later and as adults it affects them so this is all happening yeah i'm not even talking about non-muslims i'm talking about in our muslim in communities now as a high school teacher i received training on child abuse and during one of these sessions i was surprised to find out that many victims are not aware what is being done to them is wrong primarily because no one ever explained to them what was inappropriate physical contact from an adult and so i i was really shocked that kids they didn't know what was going on because um and, and as a teacher it's um 
it's, it's you find out exactly how that how sexual abuse with children is a big thing it was one of the you know it was really sad to, to find that out but you again we can't live with our heads in the sand now adult child abusers and predatory teenagers manipulate and take advantage of children's innocence and intimidate young boys and girls into doing things they don't want to so you know when we think of abuses we think of like male strangers or there's actually an equal number of predatory teenagers boys more mainly boys but girls as well who they are very you know they have ways of manipulating young their you know um younger kids and and also fellow teenagers um so what they do to add insult to injury they take photos of the kids in compromising situations subsequently to prevent the victims from telling anyone they will they say they will tell their parents or shame the child by putting the images on social media child abusers are extremely conniving and clever we need to be one step ahead of them i'm not advocating paranoia but sensible islamic parenting in the over sexualized world that our kids are growing up in we can't pass the buck yeah i think it's um I know having when I've spoken to young teenage girls a lot of the time that they, they think the parents will blame them yeah they'll say why did you it's your fault and let's say they did part of it is their fault but that actually gives the abuser more power because they know they that the girl can't go and speak to the mum or the dad because she'll get um blamed you know will she get kicked out of the house will she get beaten up um so therefore they know they have even more and then she has to then stay in that compromising situation even more and so they then have to then it starts off let's say with a kiss or with them them showing some of their they might take the hijab off or they might show you know part of their body and then the guy's then asking for more and he he's, he's basically a blackmailing her that's what has happened but part of the reason is because the girl cannot speak to the parents so we're not you know they they are literally in danger so as muslim parents we can't pass the buck as i said we have to teach rsc ourselves fundamentally just leaving it to school and society takes away the responsibility of parents to engage with this aspect of their child's lives and their physical and emotional development after all the school or society won't give the islamic perspective to the question about where babies came from i think I think you know that. So, as Muslims, we live our lives in subservience and worship of to our creator, who defines for us our morality. The moral code does not change with time or place because the source of our laws, the Quran and Sunnah, are fixed. Parents, we are the primary educators of our children on matters relating to social, emotional and spiritual development. Schools should complement but not replace this rule. In an age appropriate way we need to give our children an islamic sre we have chosen to raise our children in liberal societies that have a different set of beliefs regarding modesty chastity and love so we need to equip them with practical islamic guidance to deal with potential problems our kids should feel they can talk to us even if they have done something wrong and we will listen guide and help them to achieve this we need to plan regarding how we will discuss these delicate topics from an islamic pe- perspective with our kids as responsible mature parents we need to calmly find out what the law is in our schools in the countries we're living in and what our kids will be learning at their school getting angry and listening to emotive rumors achieves nothing now here's just if you're in the UK um there is a website and i've got the link on my web website it, this is it's called um sreislamic.org this is um a really good website you can find up to date information about the introduction of compulsory relationship education and rsc which is being brought in from september 2020 and it includes advice on how to approach your child's school in a productive manner and answer and answer it answers many questions so i think the you know my final message really is one we have to take responsibility and we secondly we then need to uh we need to focus on our kids especially now that with um if you're listening to this whilst we're all under quarantine 
now is the perfect time. You've got, we've got so much time on our hands. Use that time to research and find out. There is stuff on the net. Find out how should I talk, how am I going to speak to my kids about this? And then sit them down and talk to them. Yeah, that is, that's all you have to do. And answer, if you can't answer a question, write it down and say, I will find the answer for you. Yeah, that, that's, that's it. Simple. It's not, don't let, um, don't be daunted by this. Um, and as I said, that website, srvislamic.org, that, that has information that would help you. And I'm sure if you, if you go online, you can definitely find, find more information. It's, it's just a matter of, you need to make the effort. No one else can do this for you. Okay, so inshallah, take care. Inshallah, let's end with dua. Subhanaka Allahumma wa bihamdika ashhadu wa la ilaha anta astaghfiruka wa atubu alayk wal asr inna al insana la fi khusr illa alladhina amanu wa amilu salihati wa tawassaw bil haqq wa tawassaw bis sabr